Uh, without much further ado, may I call upon uh, another of Zimbabwe's prolific sons, uh, Hopo Chingono. Uh, thank you very much. Do not see Nimatambu Ziko, who Murie Kwama guys. I got a phone call uh, on Sunday from Alex's brother who's sitting here. Uh, I ignored the phone call because I was on another, on another call. And because we were supposed to meet anyway, I said, ah, blazing those on phone uh, <clears throat> So I ignored the call and he called again. So when he called again, I said, oh, let me pick the call. Maybe he's on his way to come and see me as we had planned. And uh, then when I picked the call, he was crying. And I said, uh, what's wrong? Then he said to me, Alex has died. Um, I had known for years that Alex had a condition. Uh, he would tweet about it from time to time. Uh, be but because of the towering figure that he was, people didn't pay attention because nobody wanted to imagine that one day um, we would receive such bad news. So I, I've, I like many Zimbabweans, um, met Alex in adult life. Um, in 2007, I made a documentary film called Pain in My Heart. Then it was, uh, it was broadcast on Sky News and CNN, and Alex watched the film. Uh, I had read a lot of his work when he was uh, contributing to News Zimbabwe. That time, social media was not as vibrant as it is today. So there were little spaces where uh, people like Alex would be found, and New Zimbabwe was one of them. And uh, so after watching this film, um, he, he, he wrote an article um, about the film. And typical of Alex, it was much more than the film. Uh, although the film 
triggered him to write the article. So I'll read a passage from the article. It says somewhere in the village, Somewhere in a village nestled in the bushes of Chikomba, there's a young girl called Tarisai. Every morning, Tarisai wakes up early to fetch water from the sandy bed of mighty Save River. The great river is dry in most parts, so in its vast belly of sand, she digs and digs until the precious liquid oozes into the hole. Amai is unwell. She has been unwell for some time, and she cannot carry her fragile body anymore let alone a load of water on her head. Tarisai is eight. Father was called to another world a year ago. The weight of the homestead is upon Tarisai's young shoulders. Thank you. <clears throat> so he, he sent an email to me and that's how our friendship started. Then in the GNU happened uh, but just before the GNU happened, I had uh, started work on another film called A Violent Response. And Alex would send emails to me uh, if I post something on, on Facebook. Um, and I would say to him, ah, Doc, why do you need to worry to get permission from, from me to use these things? You can use them. And then you'd say, ah, Wangu, you know, in our field of work, things can get complicated. And I would say to him, go ahead and, and, and use the stuff. Um, he came to Zimbabwe to join the prime minister's office. And uh, it was when he joined that office that I started to learn a lot more about how government worked. Um, one of the primary things that he told me was that, you know, corruption is so rife in this country beyond what he had imagined. He told me a story. He was supposed to have gone somewhere um, and <clears throat> he couldn't go. And um, when he came back to the office, there was a paper waiting for him to sign um, an allowance, 5,000 US dollars for the trip that he should have gone but didn't go. And he said, no, uh, these are allowances for hotels and things like that. I did not go, so I don't, I don't need this. And uh, senior government people said to him, ah, eh, Doc, maakuti viringa kajunjedu, ingo sainai, kanamsinga ide munongo tipaka mariachi. And I'm sure he shared this story with many of you. And, and he would Talk to me about the issue of incompetence, uh, how bad incompetence was in government. It was so bad that he didn't even imagine uh, that things would be so bad. That's when he said to me, you know, Hope, the problem um, goes beyond what we thought it was. This country is in a total mess. The system needs to be changed. It is not just about an individual. The system is corrupt. And we would talk about the constitution making process. And as journalists, I can't think of anyone else in this country who helped our work become so easy other than Alex Magaisa. You would go to Morgan Changrai's office and interview Morgan Changrai. And then Magaisa would say, ah, wangu, tumbu noruta wanu wanga. And he would give you a much broader picture of what's going on in government. Um, Dr. Magaisa saved us and many other people from being poisoned so many times. 
he had established a relationship because of the person that he was with the system, within the system. I'm sure many of you saw Alex talking about enablers. And then he cautioned us to say, not everyone is an enabler in the system. There are some good people. And he would, uh, he would call us, oh, be careful of this, be careful of that. Um, I mean, journalists from my generation and those who were there during the GNU, our work was made far much easier. All international journalists, the first thing they would do when they land here is, where is Alex? Because with Alex, you would get the picture of what's happening and you would also then get to interview the, 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 the prime minister. Um, he taught me that, you know, sometimes you disagree with certain things. Um, but don't throw everything away. Alex was opposed to the 2013 election. His bosses were, wanted the election, but he was opposed to it. Um, and I kept saying to him and to Advocate Chamisa that Varume Mimi, you've got so much knowledge, you need to write books. So. <laughs> 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 and I've been saying to Advocate Chamisa, because he's also my friend, he shares certain things with, with me, and I say to him, but President, these are serious issues. You should put pen to paper. And, and, and I hope that story will become complete because he knows a lot of things um, about what happened during that time. Then there was a picture, a picture, and Alex, Alex's value, his talk was so high that even his opponents understood it. One day Alex came to Zimbabwe and he went to a restaurant called The Plot with two friends. And uh, at that restaurant, there was Jonathan Moyo, there was Joao, uh, there was a uh, Kasukwere and another gentleman who didn't want to be in the picture. A, put, a picture was taken and Jonathan Moyo posted it on, on Twitter. He understood what he was doing because the, the person who carried a lot of value in that picture was Alex. <laughs> <laughs> that is why, that is why they posted the picture. So when the picture was posted, Alex called me. Wang, Dan, this is breakfast. a picture. because they are mischievous. And true to what he was saying, they posted the picture. And, but he didn't mind. He then said to me, you know, if, if, if we were doing evil things, they wouldn't be posting a picture with me in it. They understand and they understood the value. And, and then 2017, a couple of days before the coup, Alex wrote a story about Mamvure. <laughs> a few days before the coup. Mamvura, Mamvura was that guy that you don't expect to be behind the wheel of the bus. <laughs> <laughs> so you are at a township. Those of you like, who are like me and Alex who grew up in rural areas, the bus would move from township to township and all the people would get out and buy alcohol. And the bus driver would leave the bus idling. One day, Mamvura went behind the wheel and drove the bus. <laughs> <laughs> then, on the 15th or thereabouts, the coup happened. Um, 
I found myself uh, and Alex, we differed. I thought the coup was going to be a transition. I was in London when the coup happened. And we spoke with Alex. Alex said, Wang, I worked with these people, they will not change. This is just an opportunity to remove the old men who is standing in their way because they want to continue doing deals, but the old man has got other plans. Uh, the president is going to write his book one day. So I'm not going to say a lot of things. Need, the one thing I need to say is that the, the opposition supported the coup. It's on the record. And Alex said to me, our friends are making a mistake. Um, along the way, we had had arguments, and for some time we were not talking. <laughs> and one day I was sitting in my, in my dining room having dinner, the phone rang. It was Alex. Uh, we, we, we need to, to talk so much is happening in our country. Uh, that, that was Alex for you. He is not somebody who felt that because I'm Alex Magaisa, we've had a disagreement, I'm not going to come to you, you are the one who's going to come to me. That was not Alex. Alex would talk to young people. I would get screenshots from young people, so excited that imagine, I wrote to Dr. Magaisa. He wrote back, you know. And we used to joke about that. And, and you'd say, now we have to be very careful what we write. Because people, you know, are happy. Uh, and, 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 and sometimes they share things that are not supposed to be shared. Needless to say, the new dispensation, contrary to the nonsense I was reading on social media, they made an approach to Alex. And I just thought out of respect, after the period of mourning, if they continue, we'll set the record straight. <clears throat> we have got names, we know the people, some of them came through me. And Alex said, no, I'm a Zimbabwean. If you want to do things right, you don't need Magaisa's support. The whole country will support you. Don't look for individuals. Do the right things and the whole country will support you. Um, and I remember in, in, in August, in August, uh, because I'd, I've been a victim as well, because when we said, let's give them a chance, they then became angry when we started criticizing them. But in my case, I am not like President Chamisa who's going to write his memoirs after his two terms. I can talk about my story. Uh, in, in August, in August uh, of, of 2018, um, the, late, the late Doug Mnati and the living Edwin Manikai came to my home and they wanted to convince me that I should either go into government or go and run ZBC. Um, Immediately after they left, I called Alex. And I said to him, this is what these guys are saying. And then Alex said to me, Wang, it's called laundering. <laughs> they want to launder their image using you. If they are going to do a good job, people like you and me don't need to be approached in this way. We will want to work with them. Even the opposition will want to work with them. So let them fix the reforms and every Zimbabwean will be on a plane from the diaspora to come back home because they want to be part of our... Of our. And he was right. Um, when, when, when I criticized them, they started attacking me. They started lying that, oh, these people wanted jobs and this and that. There is a lot that happens behind the scenes. And as I, I keep referring to President Shamisa, because he knows a lot of the things that 
were happening behind the scenes during that time and continue to happen uh, behind the scenes. The tragedy for people like me is that we over relied on Alex. You know, when I entered the room, I was saying to Doug Coltet, it's, it's, I, I'm trying to imagine, you know, whenever I got into trouble, I would look for my lawyer, Beatrice Mtetwa, or Doug. If I can't find them, I have to look for, for Alex to say, Alex, how, how do I do this? If I done something wrong, and and the, when I was arrested for the third time in 2021, I was with uh, Honorable Job Scala. We were arrested together for the same crime that does not uh, 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 there's no law that exists for that crime. <laughs> you know, prison officers came to us one day. They were so happy. And they said, ah, you and uh, a job said, why, why are you saying that? And they said, <laughs> 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 and they had done a big Sunday, a big Saturday read. Uh, and these prison, prison officers, they, 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 they read these things. And so they came to us and said, I'm going to have to do some time on my prison officers. <laughs> because they had taken down notes. What you do some time. Beatrice Mtetwa was in Swaziland, struggling with the COVID. And I was worried. I'm going to farm and shit. <laughs> 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 Job is my witness, I'm not lying. <laughs> and, and I would start, you know, Job would then say, I don't worry, because I would start saying, you know, wanting to find out about COVID and this, because I was worried that, because she's the woman who has been with me since 2004 through all my troubles. Uh, I have no access to my guys. Each time I go into prison, my guys have became my de facto uh, spokesperson. In fact, when Doug would come, I would say, go and give this to my guys. Go and give this to my guys. Because he is the person who was able to articulate issues in a way that made it so easy for all of us to understand. And, and one of those things that he said to me, which sticks with me, and I will say it, uh, so that when you have your cabinet, when you become president of this country, you must remember this thing. He, he said to me, Wangu, uh, I took this from, from a WhatsApp message. Wangu, uh, political parties have been platforms where individual interests are negotiated, not the national interest. This has to change. You and I have to support Mkoman. Elites of a society from the form that structure that will make it fail or succeed. So he was worried about the ownership syndrome of struggles, both in ZANU PF and in the opposition. You would say to me, it worries me. The, re the reason I write the way I write, uh, you are not there. And it's a Zimbabwean problem. It's not just a ZANU PF problem. Fadzai was not there. How is she a spokesperson? Fadzai was not there. And when President Chamisa came out and said, anyone can join the party. There's no senior member. There's no junior member. That made Magaisa happy. And he said, this is going to remove the toxicity in our politics. Um, there's, there's um, one thing about the Big Saturday read. It was able to provide ideas and explain complex issues for ordinary men and women to feel that they are part of the struggle instead of being bystanders, listening to a group of guys talking about how great they were. Um, 
We, we had so much trust. And I know many of you had so much trust in Magaisa. Yes. Such that when me and Job were in prison, a Maduku, Professor Maduku came to see us and to discuss our case because our case had become topical. But, but when, uh, when, 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 uh, when uh, I'm not a lawyer, he's a lawyer. When, when Professor Maduku was sitting the other side, I, I was now, because I had now read the, some of the prison officers had given us that stuff. I was now arguing with Maduku now. <laughs> Saying, but Prof, the law says this in South Africa, there was this and that. And then, you know, Maduku is a funny guy. He says, ah, I'm going to show you my guys. I have also read I've also read that article and I agree with it. <laughs> and so I want to end by saying, by reading another, another, from the article that introduced, that made me become friends with Magaisa. One of the paragraphs at the end, he says, and when I watched Hope Watching on his powerful documentary on the scourge of AIDS in Zimbabwe, and big though I am, referring to himself as a big man, Magaisa, an African man taught from a tender age to be a man and never cry. I could not hold back my tears. Tears for a broken nation whose politicians continue to dilly-dally about power. There is temptation in the topsy-turvy world of politics to forget about these silent victims. And through this article, we became very good friends. That is why today's Zimbabwe's towering intellectual giant, Alex Magaisa, is being celebrated in the ghettos, in the townships, rural areas, I saw headmasters uh, writing some stuff and being posted by young boys in rural areas. He touched everyone's heart. And I hope we learn something from it. Thank you. It's not only about the future, but the present. But Wangu, if you can hear us, I think the present and the future are safe. You have done your job here. Uh, you have played your part. Uh, without further ado, may I call upon a, very, a sister that I deeply respect and admire. Uh, very brave, brave sister for that matter. Fadzai Maheri. It's a very good evening, ladies and gentlemen, all protocol observed. I stand here this evening with great humility. Uh, the chief spokesperson of the citizens' movement is here, uh, but he's very kindly uh, given me leave to speak um, against protocol. Uh, today is an extremely difficult night for me. Those who know me know that I'm never short of words. Know that I always have something to say, and know that I'll always say it confidently. For the first time on Sunday, I was also in church. And you know, when the offering is being given, the choir is singing, and you're scrolling through Twitter. And I was like, what? <laughs> Impossible. <laughs> Can't be. And I was, holding, I was holding my older brother's baby. And I quickly gave the baby to whoever it was who was sitting next to me, I can't even remember. And I went and made a telephone call to the president and I said, surely not. No, Ms. Mahere, it's, it's true. I sat down, didn't go back into church. I asked the Sunday school kids to go and get my handbag so I could go home. I sat in the car, and then the journalists started calling, as they always do. The first person who called me was Mduduzi. And I picked up the phone and I answered, and I couldn't get out the hello. 
got multiple calls, Voice of America, Blessing Zulu, a number of people, Studio 7, wanting a comment. And those who know me know that no matter how cornered I am, I always have a comment. I had nothing to say. And I said, sorry, colleagues, this is not the time. This is not the time. I fumbled together a statement on instruction. It was the most difficult statement I've ever had to write. And it was difficult because normally when I've got difficult statements to write, who do I call? Alex. When I've got a tough line to navigate, who do I call? Alex. When I face hostility, who do I call? Alex. And when I was preparing my address for this evening, I said to myself, you know, we're going to be in a church. Let's, let's try and keep it neutral. Then I said to myself, what would Alex say about neutrals? <laughs> Alex was very clear on which side of the line he stood. He did not stand in the middle. He stood clearly for transformation and for change. He was unapologetic to work for Morgan Shangirai in the MDC. He was unapologetic about working with the MDC Alliance as it then was. He was unapologetic about working with and being a strong pillar of the Triple C and of the citizens. And I know I speak on behalf of the president and the entire organization and indeed the wider Zimbabwean population that we are forever indebted for even the technical support he rendered to the movement. You'd give him a draft policy address, he'd fix it up for you. You'd give him a draft statement, he'd fix it up for you. You'd ask him, how do we navigate? Or you'd pick up the phone and say, hey, Alex, can you see that guy is coming after us? He's coming after us. Please go after that guy. <laughs> Alex was that mid midfielder. Didn't matter. Didn't matter, Nigel, you do soccer. Didn't matter who the striker from the other side was. He was prepared to take that person on. And he did so with intellectual acuity. He did so using the law, using his expertise, and just an amazing humility and eloquence that it's, it's going to be very difficult to match. We are very grateful for his public support. Often elites don't publicly support the movement. They want somebody to do it, but they don't want it to be themselves or their own child. Alex was happy to put himself out there. If Mr. Timber, if Mr. Makone, if the old, older <laughs> members of the MDC were here, they would agree with me and say that he had a depth of understanding of issues, of people, and of the landscape that we're going to miss greatly. Just this week, I've been confronted with situations where I'm like, oh, let me call Alex. Can't call Alex. Alex was that person where you're working midnight at chambers, you send him a voice note and say, look, this has happened, what do I do? He'd respond with a voice note and say, you know, Fadzi, why don't we do this? Fadzi, why don't you take this line? Always, always willing to help. Now, I didn't wake up a member of the Triple C. I didn't wake up a member of the MDC. Alex believed in me when most people still treated me with a lot of suspicion. When this flag came about in 2016, Alex was one of those first responders, first believers in the idea of citizen activism. And even though it wasn't cool, it wasn't popular, he picked up the phone and said, Fadzi, you're onto something with bond notes. And I remember writing a piece on my old blog about bond notes and I took on another lawyer who now is a very good friend of mine. And that lawyer said, oh, how dare you Fadzi, you're so young. Alex was like, no, 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 this is discourse. 
let's engage. And that's the man that Alex was. He encouraged, he encouraged. Just the other day, my little sister forwarded me a number of inboxes that she got from Alex when I was in prison. Oh no, don't cry, Mudiwa. Your sister wouldn't want you to cry. Your sister would want you to be courageous. How is Fuzzy doing today? Did you find her in high spirits? Alex cared. He cared even beyond what people saw. He didn't do it for show. He didn't do it for, for fame. When he wrote the big Saturday read, it was with the genuine intention to inform citizens. Because there are those who know that when the citizens are not informed, they're not power, they don't have power. But when citizens are informed, when citizens do know their constitutional rights, they sit with their back straight and they're able to talk back and stand up for themselves. That is the constitutionalism he championed time and again. In 2018, when I stood as an independent, when I made the announcement, it still wasn't that popular. But Alex was the first on the phone to say, you know what, well done for standing up. Well done for putting your hand up. Alex understood that the penny drops for people at different times. It's not the fact that you were there in 2000 that counts alone. Even if you've had your awakening in 2022, he was willing to encourage you and give you the tools to take on the regime. He embraced young people. Young people, he was interested in a new age of activism and ensuring that there was another generation available to pick up the mantle. Solidarity is something he championed. Whether we're talking of the MDC trio, whether we're talking of Marco, whether we're talking of Taku, whether we're talking of Tawandam Chehiwa, it didn't matter. If Alex was around today, he'd be saying, where is more blessing? That is Alex for you. Now, even as I sat with colleagues thinking about the best way to, to commemorate of these five days, the life of Alex, I was reminded that the, the task ahead of us is an enormous one. The work that Alex started is not yet finished. We are still the Zimbabwe, notwithstanding the great constitution of 2013 that he helped author, that the police will say, no, you can't have a big Saturday march. Well, that's rather odd. What does section 57 say? They don't care. They say to you, no, you can't peacefully light a candle for Alex Magaisa in the park because you know what? Repression. What this tells us is that we need to pick up very strongly the fight that Alex was a brave part of. There is still a lot of work to be done to ensure that we get to a new great Zimbabwe. And the question we all need to ask ourselves is what can I do? How can I be an active citizen? How can I fight for freedom? How can I raise up my voice and join the others? How can I ensure that I register to vote? And I think the biggest gift we could give to Alex is to deliver one day in Zimbabwe where freedom, where politics, where believing different are not dirty words, where you don't have to hide the fact that you're wearing yellow because it's dangerous. You don't have to hide the fact that you believe that the government is getting it wrong. It's Zimbabwe where we don't have to hide the fact that we are political and be ashamed of it. Nothing I'm saying there is new. It's all contained in the constitution that Wama Gaisa helped author. My brother, my friend, my helpmate, uh, you, you didn't have to help me, but you did, and I'm so grateful. And to the Magaisa family, I extend on behalf of millions of citizens whom he touched. 
whether it's Mazizi, whether it's the Yellow Movement, whether it's, you know, Zimbabweans far and wide in rural Zimbabwe, in urban areas, in the ghetto, in the universities, even people as far as the United Kingdom. I had a friend the other day who said to me, Fadzai, how did you know Alex? He taught me company Lord Kent. This is someone I'd worked with in The Hague. I don't think we yet realize the enormity of the void that Alex left. He touched Zimbabweans here and abroad, but he also touched people from other nations as well. Zorora um, Murugare, we can't question God, but I, I really pray that he, he rests in peace. Thank you. So as we celebrate Alex the academic, it gives me great pleasure to welcome to the podium none other than Sis Beatrice Mteto. And I, uh, my Mzuguru Nigel has already observed all the protocol I need. And uh, I wonder where Alex got the time. I think God had given him 72 hours in a day. Because everybody was speaking to him every day. <laughs> and yet he did so much. And I didn't realize that he was so young when I learned that he was only born in 1975. I was like, oh my God. When Alex was born, I was doing my final year in high school. And when he was one year old, I went to law school. When I walked into my first office as a qualified lawyer. He was two months short of six years old. <laughs> so when I heard uh, yesterday Musa and Tsikamai saying, oh, you know, Alex mentored young people. I, and today I have heard Takudzwa and Fadzai saying the same thing. I said to myself, actually, I don't know what these people are talking about. And I'm mentioning how old I was when he was born to demonstrate how he was able to straddle generations, to be the age of whoever he was dealing with. And, and I'm doing it to demonstrate also that he didn't mentor young people alone. You are all wrong that he mentored young people. And I'm speaking from experience because although I could have been his mother, he actually mentored me in more ways than one. And it's extremely difficult for me to speak about him in the past tense because I can't imagine that he's in the past. And I strongly believe that what he has done will live, live there forever for us to build on. So as we commemorate his life today, my biggest regret is that we celebrate each other when we're no longer with each other. To the CLC guys, I'm going to say, I'll disagree that say, we should have an annual lecture. I believe that we should have regular lectures to celebrate each other while we live. I felt intimidated that this is called a memorial lecture because there's Tendai, Dr. Tendai, there's Musa, Dr. Kika, there are all these scholars around. And as Tendai has said, uh, he introduced uh, uh, Alex to my late partner and they, they got on, although they were like not in the same field. So 
my view is that we should really try and celebrate each other. Alex should have heard everything that we are having to say today. So mine is not a lecture. It's just going to be musings of my take of who Alex was for me, because as you have all heard, he was everything to all of us. And he was, he could straddle those different generational uh, gaps with so much ease that you didn't even realize that he was a young person in terms of at least where I am. So my journey with Alex was a very, very simply and uncomplicated one. Now, like all young people I come across in my work, he fell into this pattern of calling Mrs. B. You've heard and I oh, Mrs. B. Everyone called Mrs. B. I actually tell them that they should call me Mama B or Gogo B because I'm not their sister. <laughs> disparities between us. Alex never shied away from contacting me and making contributions where he thought these were necessary interventions. He never shied away from saying, ah, this B, Apamanjazite, let's do it this way. Because I'm no, I've, I was never a trained constitutional lawyer. I went to university in the 70s. We had no human rights law at universities at the time. We just learned constitutional law, but even then in a passing phase. So the nuances of constitutionalism are things that I'm learning from young people like Alex, and like all the other young human rights lawyers that uh, I work with. And the beauty with Alex is that he was able, even where you can see good, he was able to say it to you in such a way that you didn't even realize that you, know, <laughs> you had made a big mess because he was also a diplomat. So that diplomacy made it very, very easy to really work with him because he was non-judgmental. He did not have the usual academic snobbery that uh, we see, present company excluded. <laughs> <laughs> but he was so humble and sincere that you could only just take him on board. So what do I think of Alex Magaisa, the lawyer that I interacted with outside CSB and uh, you know, as a uh, chilling as and when uh, he was in town? When I would have ideas and I would say, oh, we're thinking of doing this intervention, he was one of those that I immediately sent the draft. And like everyone has said, the answer would be there in a minute. Like he was just waiting for you. And then you wake up the next day, the BSR is there. Like this guy, I must speak to his wife and find out if he's performing his wifely duties. <laughs> been said by uh, uh, you know everybody who's spoken Alex was a vital cog in that constitution making process which culminated in what we now have which I consider a decent constitution I know love Mumadugu will disagree with that but uh, that's what I believe it is. And he was so passionate about that process, having lived through 19 constitutional amendments in our Lancaster House Constitution, that he 
and the team in COPAC were desperate to craft a constitution that could stand the rigors of time, that would withstand the constant mutilation that we saw in the Lancaster House constitution. So what did they do? Of course, they had the chapter nine, the chapter 10, uh, uh, 12 uh, 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 commissions, which basically were seen to be vital institutions to support democracy, the rule of law, and constitutionalism. And they believed very, very strongly that if you have strong independent institutions, democracy and constitutionalism would thrive. To make sure that those pillars are fully supported in the constitution, they had elaborate appointment procedures and our commissioners in our oversight or so-called oversight uh, 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 institutions uh, are supposed to be public were all supposed to participate, was all supposed to forward names, and in the beginning we all of course did, because we thought, yeah, it counts if you send a name. Then they put in, in chapter eight, the judiciary and its support structure, which is the JSC. Again, elaborate Appointment procedures were supposed to have 13 commissioners in the Judicial Service Commission who will superintend the appointment of judges, discipline, issues to do with justice, and even advise the government on issues uh, to do with the law and the constitution. And when you read our constitution, it, it looks great, you know. Uh, the JSC is supposed to be very inclusive and representative. There are supposed to be 13 commissioners, uh, law professors represented, legal profession represented, public service represented. Uh, it's it's uh, so well put together that, in fact, when analysis is made of constitutions, uh, I know that the Kenyan says, oh, you Zimbabweans, your appointment procedures are fantastic. Your, your composition of the JSC is fantastic. And why is that? It is because we had lived through the mutilation of that Lancaster House uh, 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 constitution so many times that if you have a constitution that is amended 19 times in such a short space of time, you know that you want something that will withstand the test of time. And the assumption, of course, was that if you have those elaborate procedures of appointing, you know, persons to fill these oversight institutions, you will have the best men and women being appointed using those processes. And Zimbabwe is not short of those men and women of integrity. Sadly, most of them don't find their way into those oversight institutions. Sadly, when they do find themselves in those oversight institutions. I don't know what happens when one gets in there. I think there's a special type of tea that they give them because the most vocal of people become mute. I know that commissioners get discovery vehicles and if you are driving a 323 before, it might be a bit difficult to speak out and then lose the brand new discovery, I don't know. As a result, we have people who go in there and they don't perform as was expected. We have a judiciary that sadly 
is no longer doing what the Constitution says it must do. We have a constitutional court which has an obligation to give us certain rights in that constitution, to interpret that constitution to expand the democratic space, to ensure that the rule of law thrives, to ensure that the constitutionalism that Magaisa and others thought about uh, thrives. You all have just come out of the interpretations of constitutional amendments one and two. You are all aware that that interpretation was not designed to give you and me the freedoms that the Constitution says we must have. It is not there to expand the democratic space. It is not there to ensure that constitutionalism thrives. It is not there to make sure that the rule of law thrives. It is not there to ensure that electoral reforms happen. And the question that I'll put to you is, what should we all do about this? So Alex was exercising his mind on these issues. This is why he set up the CLC so that there will be a space where we will discuss constitutionalism, where we will discuss where we went wrong in the interpretation of the constitution, because clearly it's an issue of interpretation. Uh, there can be no question that amendments one and two are unconstitutional. There is no question that nobody who was an incumbent in office when those pieces of legislation were crafted uh, should not be in office right now. There is no question that there was a breach of a fundamental principle of the law where one should not be a judge in his own cause. If you are a party to the proceedings, you shouldn't sit. We've seen that judges set and made decisions, and only just now in April, we've seen them seeking to benefit from the very decisions that they had made. And it is this type of thing that Alec and the constitution makers were seeking to ensure does not happen. So what can we do to ensure that Alex's legacy lives on. What can CLC do? Because I can tell you here now that it is not an accident that CLC was just set up just now now by Alex. It was a premonition. He wanted his thoughts on constitutionalism to continue. I challenge each one of you present here to support the CLC. That support is not necessarily going to be because you, are, you have a legal mind. We have a problem in Zimbabwe in that we have a, very few people who want to stand up and be counted. We have a lot of people who think that lawyers should do certain things. Just coming to CLC to say I'm available if you want to bring any litigation in my name, whatever it is, as long as it will advance constitutionalism, I'm available. I want to say to the business executives who knew Alex and who are here, those bone notes you don't know what to do with, CLC can use them to advance constitutionalism. <laughs> we have a very sad culture in Zimbabwe where the business community, which is affected more than all of us in the policy flip-flops that we experience every day. I think if we counted the statutory instruments, 
that have come out this year, we'd probably run out of, 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 of figures because they are so many and you don't know whether the following morning they'll still be there. It is a tragedy that business, the corporates, who are affected the most by the, by the current failure of governance is not supporting voices of reason where we are saying we have a supreme law of the land, it must be respected. We currently have legislation that is pending which is meant basically to shut down civil society. And that means there'll be no funding coming from anywhere outside to support vital constitutional issues in the country. Constitutional issues that affect the corporates as much as they affect us, the ordinary people in the street. Business must come to the table and openly support civil society. <laughs> Business must understand that where there is the rule of law and constitutionalism and democracy, investments will follow and the economy will thrive. So I appeal to each one of you do not say, I don't have anything to offer, I don't know anything. Each one of us can contribute something towards what Alex believed in. I'll also say that, you know, given the fact that the CLC is already there, It, 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 it shouldn't be that difficult to do the right thing because the reason Alec was as prolific as he was is because God knew that his person had limited time. It will be a huge tragedy if that prolific writing and prolific expose of constitutional issues to the most, the smallest of us and the biggest of us in the simplest of terms stops. So part of the CLC as I see it is for them to go out there and simplify the constitution uh, for everybody in the way that Alex did. You could never read any Latin and legal jargon in Alex's words. If you don't litigate, if you don't take cases to court, you'll have no basis whatsoever of saying they are captured or not doing the right thing. So I'll again encourage all of us, particularly at CLC, to look at public interest litigation, to continue litigation, take cases to the Constitutional Court, lose those cases, but you will have a body of literature on which we can build because we'll be able to say to our Zugurus that we did something. Here is a body of evidence that we took matters to court. Yes, we lost with Asian. Go to CLC where they'll find the money in this world. I am pained that Alex did not leave to see the kind of Zimbabwe that he wanted. I am pained that we've trampled on the good work that Kopak did when they pained that he left us as we approach an election that by all standards will be bloody. I am pained that those who are receiving advice from him will have nobody to turn to come the troubles that are ahead of us for 2023. It's my desire, hope, 
prayer and belief that we can say to Alex, Msaigwa, you are gone. But society, as lawyers, as, as, as though activists, young and old, Takudzwa, uh, Inindi Ripano, I may not be able to fix, to fit Alex's shoes, but I am here. I may not have his legal acumen, but hey, if you get me and Fadzi, we might elaborate and work together in the way that Alex did. But of course, Alex was not just a scholar and someone who just talked constitutionalism. With Alex, we could chill. We could uh, have a good time. He would never leave the house or Harare. You'd never leave Harare without seeing Sis B. You know, uh, it's like uh, Sis B Tiruguya, and he loved when he was coming, would tell me, Sis B, you know my menu, and he loved me to cook oxtail, sadza, nembora. And we would eat that. So he, he was not like, you know, these serious scholars who are always having their glasses and uh, <laughs> not knowing how to chill. <laughs> he was an all-rounder. Yeah. So, uh, Tendai, where's Musa? You should learn to be like Alex. <laughs> Come, let's chill. That's the best thing you can uh, 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 do for him. Break bread with your brothers and sisters. For if I had been a naughty child, you could have been my son. <laughs> Relatives, friends, my Makaisa. It's incredible that we all know so much about your person. And we don't know some of you. But through Alex, we know you. Through Alex, we are your friends. Through Alex, we are your relatives. Through Alex, we are your advisors. So please, feel free to continue nourishing this seed that he has sown. It can only germinate if we water it if we pursue the dreams that he pursued. Yes, it's easier said than done. Because can't we find the time? So, yes, Tineurombo Taratsikiratese. But let's keep together and let's hope that his body will be brought to Zimbabwe and that we'll be able to all participate and lay him to rest peaceful. Alex, rest in peace, Msaigwa. Your legacy will live on in the body of work you have left behind. Thank you. Businesses do not advertise because they are big. They advertise because they want to reach potential new customers. Advertising helps you move your goods off the shelves. Brand visibility engraves your brand in the hearts and minds of your old and new customers. Sly Media TV has a package for everyone, big or small. We stream it all. We take your product and event to over 326,000 followers on Facebook and 96,000 subscribers on YouTube. We cross post to over six pages with a reach of over a million followers of free quotation. 263-772-863-484 or 263-775-964-8 streaming at gmail.com. Sly Media TV, building bridges.